Can you hear me, Courtney? Hey. Hey there, lady. How you doing? Good. How about yourself? Doing well. Just uh, just getting in. Today is a busy day. Great day. Hey, do you mind clicking on your um, name and changing, put Daryl and then put uh, host next to your name? Okay, how to do that? Because my name says Daryl now, but where do I need to go in to do that? Okay, so click on participants. Okay. Click on your name. Or do I click more? I'm um, sorry, more. Okay. Yep. All right, and then it says rename. Okay. And then. And Mm -hmm. And what do you want me to put? My name is up there now. But what do you want me to put? What else? Host, capital H O S T. Or you could just put peace host. So P E A C E, all capitals, and then host. Okay. There you go. Very All right, good. and then um, let me see, minimize that. Um, where is it? I hadn't done it in a while. Where is it to let people in? We don't have to worry about letting people in because once they put their password, they come in, right? We don't have to let people in. Correct. Correct. But mm -hmm. if for some reason it does, it's at the top of your screen and a blue box comes on. Okay. So, so I just wanted to be aware of that. Yeah. Hey, Courtney, can you change, rename yours? Because it says collab on it. Can you hear me? He may, he may have stepped away. I'm not sure. I know he was just texting me a few minutes ago. Oh, no, he, it, he changed it. Okay. So you must be super mom because I don't see nothing what you see. <laughs> no, well, I'll take it. You got, you you know, got superpower. <laughs> I'm always growing in technology, so. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. and I saw him just change it. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm gonna come. Uh, just stop my video and mute it because I'm going to jump on the website and be managing that at the same time. So. Okay. Just know my video will probably be off most of the time only because I'm managing the website in case okay. people are trying to ask questions. Cool. Sounds good. I love the I love the screen where it says we'll be starting shortly. Looks great, Courtney. Yeah, I'm Very cool. PowerPoint. What's that? I'm, uh, is, is a, I'm running a PowerPoint in the background so you can set it on rotation so what i can do is after this i can forward it out to the other uh, coaches and then they can fit in what they want to fit in and then it, you just pull it up on screen share and it does the rotate and all of that so i love screen. that it's rotating it looks so great i can't see anything all i see is welcome so but you see something rotating mm -hmm. yeah okay yep. and then i can see i see you guys are recording so i'll remind you before you shut it down to send the recording. Okay, for sure. Sounds good. Actually, never mind. It just automatically goes to the cloud uh, to your thing. Never mind. You don't have to email it. Faith, Faith's going to take care of that. She's going to pull it off of there and email it to Ashley so we don't even have to worry about it. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Sounds good. Been praying for you guys. It's going to be great. We are all aligning today. Yeah. 
Everybody on the call is aligning. Okay, um, I did. I don't know. Did you hear me tell Daryl I'll have my video off because I'm going to work the website. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, um, so I'm getting off now. Just text me if you need something. Okay. Dante, standing by too. You might want to mute yourself, Daryl, until you guys go live.
Okay, I have to say hello to Lindley. I guess I need to unmute myself before I talk. <laughs> <laughs> so good to see you, friend. Wow, how you been? Well, I've been going through cardiac rehab since uh, late December, and that started off poorly, but has uh, done remarkably well in the last maybe four weeks. So I can do things I haven't been able to do for a couple of months. Wow. So thumbs up, man. Praise God. Praise God. Glad to Have hear you. you're doing well now. And I'm back online and I'm back going to church things and I'm starting two small groups. So uh, I'm not operable. I'm not uh, stentable. So ask for divine healing for me because <laughs> that's what it's going to take. And I'm just going to stay in the saddle till what happens happens. All right. You got it, Lindley. I'm covering you in prayer. Thank you, man. Incredible, incredible friend to the kingdom. So it's good to see you. Good to see you again, too. I'm going to mute myself for a little bit.
Good to see you, Tally. Good to see you as well. Can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. Great. How you doing? All right. It's uh, been a crazy uh, 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm glad you're here. Hello, Jim. Good to see you. Hello, Danny. Long time no see. I'll turn my camera on so you can really see me. Now I can hear better. There we go. Oh yeah, you sound clearer too. Great. I was going to share uh, that we had a pastor down the street where um, they host a group of young men who are um, kind of coming out of uh, violence, gang violence, and uh, about 40 of them were together yesterday in the church when someone ran in and shot uh, one of them. And so uh, it's, it's, it's been a long it's been another long 24 hours. <laughs> so sorry to hear that, Tally. Wow. Definitely. We'll pray for them and, and the ministry and, and the families involved and you as you minister to them. So a lot of praying going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my. Well, thank you for being here and making it. A... Hey, Brother Tally, how you doing, sir? Good, Pastor, how are you? Good, just heard a snippet, but uh, we'll be lifting you up. Appreciate that. And uh, Courtney, you uh, did you want me to share my my screen or send you the? I can share my screen; it's not a problem. First of all, good morning to you. We got you lifted up um, in prayer and everyone involved. Praise God. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I gave you your co-host right, so you definitely can share your screen. Um, hearing about uh, two. Two minutes. I'll turn on screen share, and then um, you can um, dive in from there. But I'll do the introduction um, of yourself and everything. So um, I think I got it right. Your shadow heals. You walk on water. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> But I am going to try really hard doing it, that's for sure. <laughs> well, to be honest, I walk on water. It's called ice. <laughs> Frozen water, you got to crawl, right? <laughs> so that's that's, right. Okay. that's my version. Right. <laughs> You pray for us if we pop out, uh, Courtney. We're supposed to have some some storms and possible tornadoes, which is not the norm here. And the uh, wind is stirring up a little bit, so if we pop out, that's why. 
They definitely got she got listed in prayer as well. Yeah. Uh the room in your location which is surrounded by four of the four walls. Yeah. Yeah. North Oklahoma. So um Yep, the winds are kicking up pretty hard. Good afternoon to all of you, to everyone joining us uh, at this time. I know people are still connecting in. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. We're honored to have you. Um, we're honored to uh, be here with you today to share, to start conversation, um, to hear, to listen. And so again, as everybody are jumping on, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I don't want to jump out, start saying names just yet because I don't want to uh, mispronounce everyone's name, but my name is Courtney. Um, I am one of the North American uh, Peace uh, Senior senior Pastor Peace Coaches. I also joined uh, with my co-host here, uh, Pastor Darrell. Uh, he is also one of our North American um, Senior Pastor Peace Coaches as well. He is a former chaplain in the United States Army. And we also have our guest present, uh, presenter for today, uh, Dr. Tally Harrison. Uh, he is joining us today. He told me not to tell you guys that he walks on water in the shadow hills. Uh, but <laughs> he is a phenomenal, phenomenal person. Um, even in this time that we've been introduced and had a few chats and a few opportunities to talk. Um, he is sought after not only all over the nation, but he's sought after throughout the world um, to be brought in to help consult, to, to, um, to speak, to teach, to lecture. Uh, he has um, a heart of humility. Uh, he lives that out, and you will definitely know that when you hear him speak and when you hear him share with us today. Um, we're grateful to have uh, him here with us, and we're honored that um, he has carved out time in his schedule. Um, and in James um, chapter one, it says something very powerful because he's going to give us the thought process of the theology of listening. And in James chapter one, it says everyone should be quick to listen, um, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Uh, literally, this is what uh, Dr. Talley lives out. He embodies this. And so I'm excited to get into this conversation today. So again, as you're joining on, uh, again, we're grateful for you joining on with us today. And uh, we're just uh, honored to have him here and excited to hear what God is going to speak uh, through him um, and through all of us as we have this conversation as we talk. Uh, so without uh, further ado, before I turn over to uh, Dr. Talley, uh, let me open up in prayer and pray for all of us uh, so that way we can uh, just really have our hearts and minds uh, ready to receive uh, from, from God. So Father, we come to you today today. Um, this is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and I pray that we are glad in it. Um, this moment in time that we're all here, God, as your shepherds, as your leaders, that you are the great shepherd. Uh, you established that and all of us, uh, we get the opportunity to, to be under shepherds, to be able to partner with you and what you're doing um, in and throughout the world. So God, we just invite you into this moment. Uh, I pray that our, our, our ears are sensitive to hear what you want to speak to every single one of us. Um, God, I just thank you for this moment in time that is not um, a happenstance. It's not by accident, but this was a divine appointment that you wanted to meet us all here. And God, I just ask that your revelational knowledge, your wisdom will pour through uh, Dr. Talley today as he shares with us. Uh, even in this moment, God, I pray that you would give him just a supernatural uh, anointing of you, that even now in this moment, um, his heart is heavy in ways, but God, I pray that um, in this moment is it's your strength that he leans on, it's your power that he leans on um, as he begins to pour out what you want to share with each and every one of us. Um, God, and we just um, are humbled and thankful to hear from you. Let us not forget that it's a privilege it's an honor. It's something beautiful to be able to hear you speak today um, through your servant, Dr. Talley. And so, God, we thank you. We love you. And may everything we do bring glory and honor uh, to your name. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Um, amen and amen. 
Yeah. Well, sir, uh, hopefully I did a good enough introduction uh, <laughs> to introduce you. <laughs> Uh, we're so grateful for you to be here. One quick note for everyone, uh, just to let you know, uh, the session is being recorded, um, but this we wanted to let you know that up front, but nothing will be shared in the manner of, of the discussion. So we're only capturing the, the presentation side that uh, uh, Dr. Tyler will be sharing with us today, but it is a safe place. It's a safe uh, place for us to get real, uh, to be open. God is not scared of real um, at all. He loves real. But for us to have that conversation, so just want to let you know that. So we see the little recording thing up there. Uh, it is a safe place for uh, us to be here. We're just capturing uh, the segment and uh, in, in his presentation, what he's going to share with us today, uh, because we know that other people are going to desire to hear what God is going to speak through him. And so just wanted to put that disclaimer out. But without further ado, uh, sir, the I would say the floor is yours, but I'm going to say the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Uh, it's good to be with you all. Um, and good afternoon from uh, wherever you are in this world uh, that we are in now today. It seems more and more that this uh, space that we occupy um, hopefully is not permanently virtual as we lean more and more into uh, trying to move forward as best we can, right? As best we can. So. It's great to be with you. I, I'm gonna add just one thing in the comment section about this. And uh, I think Pastor Courtney is right on. Um, I, I really want to be the uh, model vulnerability and um, live into what it means really to be transparent and vulnerable and and also courageous. Um, and and so I believe God has called me to this and which, which means that often I, uh, say this before I get started, which is I have thick skin. <laughs> uh, this is my call. So I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit to be in these places uh, and um, believe that that is a welcoming invitation. That is a, 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 a full invitation for you to step right into this work um, and this conversation. All right, step right in. Just whatever you bring, just bring it. It's, it's good, good, good with me. All right, it's good with me. All right, as well, uh, if you don't mind, while I'm just doing our kind of introductory words that get, will get our conversation going in the second half of this hour, uh, if you wanna present some ideas as, as I'm talking, go ahead and put that in the chat uh, as well, or questions or other statements that um, can be added, you go ahead and do that, we're good with that. I'll pick those up then in the, the second half hour uh, of, the, of this time, all right? All right, and let's go. So as, as uh, Pastor Courtney said, I'm Tally Hairston. Uh, I don't go by Dr. Hairston, um, just not yet. I'm still getting used to it uh, as I warm up to it. But much of what I share today though can be credited to those who I've co-labored with through the years who are in other countries. Uh, I've been blessed to do this work in a variety of countries over the last uh, 20 years since 2001 uh, and uh, really blessed by the co-laborers in the Southern Hemisphere who have really uh, contributed to how I think a lot about this uh, as well as their work with scripture and how that's informed my own thinking about this. In addition, I've been working with, um, as a youth, I started as a youth outreach worker, um, hired uh, through a grant with Rural Vision in my neighborhood and started walking with young folks um, in hard situations, as well as uh, a boy's home, a residence boy's home, of uh, boys who were warders of the state. Uh, that's a lot where I have learned um, in addition to my seminary education, but really there's a practical theology that comes out of experiencing this on the ground that, that this is, um, really poured a lot into me around. There's, there was nothing more informative, really, to be honest, of, of being in a residence boys home, do, working the, uh, the uh, night shift, working the night shift with young folks who uh, really um, needed help. Uh, and so that's, that's poured into my life a lot. And I, I will not um, kind of, I don't want to come off as this came through a book. <laughs> 
some of it did come through books, some of it's come through learning, but a lot of it has come from putting my hands in the dirt, all right? So let me share my screen to start us off. Uh, make sure I get this right. All right, here we go. Always interesting how Zoom will get you to share or not share. <laughs> that is the question. All right, here we go. Okay, uh, so th today I'll be talking just a little briefly uh, for a few more minutes on the theology of listening in frustrating times. Uh, John Paul Lauterock in his book on the moral imagination brought his extensive missional ministry of peacemaking to the question. Uh, and the biggest, the question he, or the problem statement he proposed in that project was, how do we transcend the cycles of violence that bewitch our human community while still living in them? Uh, similarly, um, for Roderock, I spent the majority of my ministry working with communities, as I said before, in change and conflict positions of violence or in marginalization. I found myself journeying with this question often. Uh, Lederach then answers this question of transcending violence to peace as rooted in the ability to forge our capacity to generate mobilize and build the moral imagination. And so I have found Lederach's thought there to be very accurate, right? The work of transcending violence and building peace is rooted in our ability to, e to imagine, to imagine again in new ways. But also in addition to the moral imagination, I'd add to that uh, from my journey and the journey of others that the work is to transcend, that the work to transcend violence is rooted also in the ability to have a prophetic imagination, to lean into the prophetic imagination as well. But both of those, whether moral imagination or prophetic imagination, both are really reliant on the imagination. And um, as you might imagine, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 10 and, and verse five talks about casting down imaginations. Right, and, and, and that word imaginations there or every thought that, ex, that, uh, 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 that super, seeks to uh, override God's thought, right? Um, in that way, we are looking very similarly at 2 Corinthians 10 when we use that word imagination, right? Every thought that casts itself above, we cast it down, right? That's the thought or teaching that, that in 2 Corinthians 10 and five leans into. But let me go a little deeper into imagination before I get into the comments on listening. Um, imagination is, um, to deepen our context just a bit, is a word that can elicit many responses, right? It can take a negative connotation when we say imagination. Um, I began working to understand this word so much so that I was compelled to center my PhD research in cognitive studies, right? Cognitive studies or better said, how to make, how we make sense of things or how we learn things such as the learning sciences. As uh, someone with a seminary degree and pastor um, and someone who's involved in the community, in particular, I became very curious how we think about things as um, in terms of imagination, um, but not, not necessarily what we think, but rather how we think, how we think in processes. And I'm gonna go one step further and say, how we think about culture and culture constructions, okay? This, I became very interested in this in, related, in re, relation to my career, which and for 17 years was in higher Christian higher education. But what I've learned has led me to seek out something about how God listens and why God listens. And what does it mean for God's people to listen? Are we supposed to have a ministry of listening? And in particular, in these times and in these seasons where there are a lot of people talking, the real question I want to ask, knowing a little bit more now about how we think, I want to ask, do we need a ministry of listening? And what would be a theology of listening? I, I really found it interesting um, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the 
in his book, Life Together, uh, written in 1954, right before social media, before modern day seminary training, the German theologian most noted for his contributions to public theology uh, formed in his vocal resistance to Nazism and Hitler, uh, Bonhoeffer said something very important. He said, many people are looking for an ear that will listen. Mind you, this is 1954. They do not find it among Christians because these Christians are talking where they should be listening. He goes on to say, but he can no longer, but he who can no longer listen to his brother will soon be no longer listening to God either. He will be doing nothing but prattle in the presence of God too. This is the beginning, he goes on to say, of the death of the spiritual life. And in the end, there is nothing left but spiritual chatter and clerical condescension arrayed in pious words. One who cannot listen long and patiently will pre presently be talking beside the point and, and be never really speaking to others, albeit he be not conscious of it. Anyone who thinks that this his time is too valuable to spend keeping quiet will eventually have no time for God or his brother, but only for himself and for his own follies. Wow, I had not heard anyone raise listening to that level. Similarly to what Pastor Courtney read at the very beginning, my experience with listening was shut your mouth and listen. Something my parents said growing up or be quick to hear and slow to speak, right? To be, be quick to listen. That's as much as I took away from it. I did not know how much listening would move me into a space of conflict resolution, of peace building and peacemaking. This quote brought me back to the pivotal moments and turning points in the life of God's people though. Exodus three, God reveals himself to Moses and says, not Moses, you are a great person, I have a work for you. That wasn't the first thing God said to Moses. It wasn't Moses, you're gonna walk on water too. <laughs> he didn't say that. God said, I have heard the cries and distresses of my people. God responds by choosing Moses. God's call upon Moses' life to lead God's people is a response to hearing the cries of God's people. The book of Psalms is filled then with exhortations to cry unto the Lord. For our God is a listening God. And well, Jesus does this. He listens to Peter's revelation. After Jesus asked him, Peter, who do men say I the son of man am? This Peter, this hard head Peter, this too afraid Peter, this I can't walk on water, I'm sinking Peter. Jesus hears Peter long enough to recognize that Peter has a word from heaven. Well, let me go back now to imagination or cognition and provide for us then what, what amounts to a, the place of frustration. Our imagination is built around three spheres. This is what we're beginning to learn. They're largely built around truth claims and cultural constructions like symbols and images and traditions and practices and other norms. And they're also housed or um, impacted by the individual and community environment that we all participate in. In many ways then, our cognition or imagination is situated within an, a space and time, right? Whether we like it or not, our truth claims get lived out in the sphere of cultural constructions within a particular environment. That is how uh, God has made us as social beings. Um, for example, to give an offering would change 
if our mode of compensation were pound cakes or biscuits. Now, I might like that, but everything would have to change. Our offering plates would change. How we receive that offering might also change, right? You can't use a debit card if the mode of compensation for how we get paid are biscuits and pound cake. Though, if you want to send me a pound cake as a love offering, I'm more than willing to accept it, right? But you get the point. Our culture is the place in which we live out our truth claims. The place then of overlap is important. But before I get to the overlap, notice this, the place of truth claims is where we have, or better know things like faith, right? We better know things like faith. And then, and then the cultural constructions is the place where we do meaning making. It's where we build institutions and practices and, and solidify things we, we truly want to be represented or symbols in the community. When I say Apple, you have to get clarification because it has two different meanings for some of us. It, it can be a thing full of electronics or it can be a thing full of goodness, vitamin C, potassium that we eat. Or some of us like to do maybe smother in peanut butter. The, the, the place that is the place of frustration, but also the place of imagination is the overlap between them. Where these meet is where most of us experience frustration, but it's also the same place that we experience imagination. So when Bonhoeffer calls us to a ministry of listening, when he calls us to understand why God is a listening God and why God's people possibly need to lean into a theology of listening, we're identifying the place where the moral imagination is in many ways inspired. It's it's at the place of frustration. And that way the church is in the perfect place, though it may not seem like it right now. The church is in the perfect place to see its moral and prophetic imagination expand. Why? Frustration and imagination are coming together. Tons of stories in scripture where frustration and imagination came together in David's life or Joseph's life. You remember when Joseph was greatly frustrated through his entire ministry. It's not until Joseph realizes he has now the imagination. He says, maybe everything that has happened to me has happened for the sake of my brothers and me being in position to serve them. And he begins to imagine a new day. Filled with frustration, he cries. He doesn't know if he should cry. He doesn't know if he should present himself right. Frustration and imagination coming together as he seeks to make meaning out of his own faith in a place for the very first time. So in the midst of this then, I started to write down and practice some things that I did not know were going to be life-changing for myself or the people I shared them with. So let me just share three of them because we will not have time to cover all of them, but let's just cover three of them, okay? Listening is loving. Listening is loving. Do you know in the English language, this is an incorrect sentence. So as someone who studies cognition, you know what this means? It means that this doesn't have a schema or place in our brain for it. When, when there is not language for something, it often means that there is not an idea about how to construct it, how to make meaning of it. Listening is loving though. How does God show his love towards us? God listens. How do we show love? We listen. And here's the challenge. The problem with listening and loving is most of the time in the place of frustration, we've been trained to speak and not listen. We've been trained to defend our position and not listen. But remember, if the goal is the imagination to be fused with God's wisdom and understanding in our own lives so that we have something to speak from, then listening is important 
to loving and loving is important to listening because they can generate a prophetic utterance, a prophetic imagination. Number two, listening precedes serving. I like to say it like this, you, we cannot help, we cannot help who we have not listened to. For how do we know what they need if we have not listened? You remember the story of Mary and Martha. I never saw the story this way until till this. Martha was encumbered about many things as, they host, as she hosted Jesus and requested Jesus instruct Mary to help her, right? Have her help me. But Jesus says, Mary have chosen the necessary thing. What did Mary choose? To sit at Jesus' feet and say nothing? To be lazy? To not be a help to her sister? Or did she choose to listen? How many of us are encumbered with serving, but do not proceed it with listening? In this way, how do we know what we're doing is actually helping if we have not heard? And then lastly, and this is the one that uh, probably takes up the most time to explain, but I don't have time. So this is, I'm going to shrink this down just to say, listening creates space for healing. Listening creates space for healing. And we can talk about this more, but let me give you an example. In Acts chapter six, the Greek speaking widows were not being served. The apostles widows were being served. And a complaint came to the apostles. Greek speaking widows are not being served. They created a space for healing. How do we know? The Bible says they listened and they prayed and then they selected leaders of wisdom full of the Holy Spirit to serve a need. This was huge for them. How do we know? Well, the ethnic, eth the ethno-linguistic differences and the cultural differences were now being introduced to the church for the very first time. This is where diversity steps in the church. Did you see the folks who were selected? They came from everywhere. This was a ministry response to create a healing space for those widows who had not been served. Mind you, Widow service goes back to the early days of the Jewish tradition. In fact, God said, if you did not attend to the, to the widow, I will not bless you. So they, every little boy and girl knew, take care of the widows. But now the church is the first and someone gets left out of the food service. Right? Someone didn't get a piece of pound cake. And what do they do? They listen. This is what's powerful about listening. Let me talk about the healing part. What we're beginning to learn about the brain is this. When you make space for people to talk with a trusted listener, they begin, and we've learned this through brain studies on trauma. When you give them space to talk, their brain begins the process of healing by building language around the trauma. If you've ever seen anyone who goes into shock, they can't talk, right? It's like, I can't, I don't know what to say. This was so traumatizing. I have no words, word. In the beginning was the word. And building their capacity for healing that the building of their capacity for healing is directly connected to being able to speak in a trusted setting so that their healing can come as their brain begins to create language around the trauma. Now being able to speak about it, they can give it, they can be healed 
So it that should not surprise anyone that the Bible records that once Stephen was chosen to serve the Greek widows, what followed Stephen? The Bible says miracles of healing followed Stephen. Mm -hmm. Because these folks having an opportunity to begin to work out their trauma through speaking or their problems or their hurt or their anger or their frustration by talking allowed their brain to begin to rewire. We did this in a ministry called Urban Roots and we saw inner city youth bring in everything under the sun. And as we made space for them, they began to experience healing. The next step after listening was to create what we called a dialogue. We simply realized that dialogue can be defined as Emmanuel, the word between us, God with us, right? So we said then the word that can come out of listening between us is the, is the healing solve to their problem. And in that way, our discussions that came out of listening, not only healed them, but healed us. And we became encouraged and our faith became lifted by listening to young people who experienced great trauma and pain and poverty and anger and disillusionment walk out feeling empowered. And then they said, who is it that you follow? Who is this God you're talking about? Why do you believe him? And, 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 and does it have anything to do with the love that we've experienced and you creating a trusted space for us just to talk it out? I'll stop there because I could go on for another half hour just telling you stories from the last 12 years of doing this work, not just here in Seattle, but in other cities across the country. And, and now in a place called Beringio, Colombia, where we've been for the last eight years doing work alongside great leaders there. It's just amazing that a, a ministry of listening to the simple thought of being quick to listen, but be full of so much revelation. God bless you. Let's talk. Let's talk. Wow. Um, since we want to get real and thank you, uh, thank you, Tally, for everything you shared. Um, I'll go first. Uh, as you said, it says we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. I think I've been on the other side before, um, where I am quick to mm -hmm. speak, um, slow to listen and quick to get angry because people are not hearing me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. you sparked so many things, right? I, I don't know if we have the time, all the <laughs> questions. Um, you, you, I mean, you brought stuff that sparked so many questions. And so not even questions, just even thoughts. But um, a person who was pivotal in my life, Dr. Mark, Michael Lapina, thank God for him and uh, rest his soul. He's a, mm -hmm. um, a physician. And I was just asking him, interviewing him for a high school project about being a doctor. And he said the, his secret sauce was to put his notepad and note pen aside and to listen to the patient. And he said, even if you notice when you show up to the doctor's office at home, you feel horrible. But the fact you walk in the doors, you automatically start to feel better and you haven't received any medicine. So your symptoms actually... <laughs> Or not as bad as they felt at home because you know you're about to be heard. And so when you're saying the human mind, that was just so when I was like, wow, that's just so powerful. And he said that he says people actually treat themselves when they show up to the physician because mm -hmm. how long has this been going on? When did it start? And you just he says he put his notepad and pen and people diagnose themselves in a way. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and but, just think if he were a frustrated doctor, right? And this is this is what we lean into. If he's if he's a frustrated doctor or a frustrated physician, a frustrated pastor, a frustrated minister, mm. a frustrated outreach worker, your brain struggles to listen when it's frustrated in that way, right? So this is this is a, an encouragement that your frustration needs to become fuel for you for listening. 
right? Not letting the frustration become a deterrent to listening, but letting it become fuel to listen, that God has given you the, the direction of this spiritual discipline of listening. Mm -hmm. well, what would you say, you said something so good, um, and you said something previous also, um, in the manner you said, our, we are taught to um, defend ourselves or we're taught to, and I, it's, it's even hearing it, I guess you don't realize how, how we are taught, but as I'm hearing sure. that and you're saying we're taught to, you know, frustration we're taught to, and of course we teach our kids, speak up for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. I, I sure. don't, how do we yeah. help the transference of that? Of, and I guess, where's that line at of, of speaking up for yourself, not to be ran over, but I'm hearing such a ministry when you said a theology of ministry. Where's that line at? How is that? Like, I feel like it's in line in a way, but I see more fruit in the factor of choosing to go into the theology of listening more than speaking up for myself or any of those things. So have you, have you, um, how would you respond to that question of walking that line, um, not to be a doormat, but also at the same time, the fruit that is so much produced in the healing, as you're saying, and the theology of listening, how do you walk that line? How would you encourage us to, to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the interesting thing is when you read the gospels and you see how many times Jesus listens to somebody, I would go, Jesus, you could just like snap your fingers and be done with them. And he doesn't. We're talking about... Um, whether it's a woman who was full of demons <laughs> and Jesus hears their cry and responds to Nicodemus saying, hey, can we have a conversation? Wait, you're, you're, you're a part of the problem, Nicodemus. I know, but can you just come talk to me for a bit, right? <laughs> you, you see this throughout script, Jesus's life. Um, Samaritan woman, I mean, she's like, she, she knows where to worship. This is, she goes, I know where to worship. <laughs> And Jesus has a conversation with her, which means he makes space for her to speak. I think there is a fine line between someone yelling at you and then creating space in which people can safely communicate what they're experiencing. And why is that important? It's important for, for not only the things we've said, but oftentimes if we're going to have a ministry of listening, we can't wait until people are so frustrated and so angry and so hostile that all they do is yell. See, this, when you've reached that point, I'm no longer, I'm, my brain is shut off and now I'm just, I'm ev evoking I'm, and I'm just provoking you through the, the pain and the frustration that I'm having. So it's important for us to have a ministry of listening because we can be strategic we can land on the ground, come into, uh, be a part of a community where we are listening and that is being done way before they experience that frustration, way before they're hollering and yelling and hollering and yelling and screaming. Instead, what we found is the more space you make for people to speak, the less likely they are going to be toxic towards you. <laughs> the less likely they're, over time, they become less toxic towards you. And soon, pretty soon, they're texting you, asking you, or calling you, asking you, hey, can we talk? Right? They're, they're asking for space and time. And you see this once again in Jesus' life. The more space he makes, the more people are willing to pursue him and go, can I, can I pull on your, your, your coat and just talk to you for a minute? Why? Because something happens when, when I speak to you. I think we become trained that something only good happens when we're speaking to people. But there's when scripture we see something happens when people are speaking to us. I'll stop there. And Ryan has this hand up, by the way. I don't know if you want me to call on him or Courtney, if you want to call him out. So yes. absolutely, Ryan, sir. Good to see you. Please. All right. I remember to take it off you. It's only been a year. Finally get the Zoom thing down. Thank you so much for, for your uh, your talk there. Um, 
I was in a setting a couple of years ago, uh, a bunch of young pastors asking this uh, advanced ministry leader, just advice for young pastor. And he said, uh, the ministry of the ear. And uh, also when I saw that the talk come across for this week, so I'm like, it's just been on my mind. It's been on my heart, this, this idea. And my, the theology of listening, that's, this is something that I've been, you know, wanting to develop further. And uh, I, I love just the part that you had mentioned about uh, listening leads to healing. Uh, so often we try to uh, come up with the solutions uh, that we think people need without hearing what they are. Um, there's nothing groundbreaking. So we know we should listen. James is very clear, all that. My question for you, what do you find is the biggest obstacle to people listening? Is it a, a sin issue, attitude problem? Like we know we should do it, but we don't do it. Why not? What have you seen in your experience? Yeah, it's funny you ask that. Um, uh, since I started doing this research on cognition, uh, it, it has blown my mind. Uh, I, I actually was sitting in a parking lot of a church when a faith-based or Christian drama team asked me to, to do a training with them. And I really felt led and started writing down three, four pages after it was over, they called me and said, that was the most moving thing they'd ever experienced. I was like, no, it wasn't. It was just a thing God gave me in the parking lot, but it's God's word, amen, yay. <laughs> um, that was six years ago. Uh, that same, literally that same talk has taken me to, from Paris to Colombia to you name it. It is literally the same thing God gave me in that parking lot. And, it's, and this is what you just heard is, is really the introduction to that entire piece. What you're asking is something that's, that many times, um, I don't think people take into consideration why the scripture says, be quick to listen. The scripture could have just said, listen, listen well, listen deeply, but be quick to listen. What we're realizing is the problem with listening is the way our brains are created. <laughs> Don't worry, hold on, hold on. Our brains are better at forgetting than they are remembering. What our brains do is take tons of necessary information, whittle that information down to only that which is connected to a previous idea so that we can then fit it into that schematic, right? We plug those two together and we, that's how we remember information. What that means then is that big pieces of information get whittled down into little bits and then they get put into that part of your brain and then you go, okay, I remembered that. So probably all of you have something in your home that if I said, go get that one thing that reminds you of this big thing, you could do that because that one thing gets downloaded into the, that mit, that big thing gets downloaded into that one thing. So your brain doesn't have to remember all the details. It just remembers that one thing. And when you bring that one thing up, it recalls all of that information for you, right? So because our brains work that way, the, the activity of listening gets confused by the types of lenses you have or the, what we call frameworks that you have that, that cause you to view certain information first or through a perspective that's different from the one speaking. Okay, well, let me give you an example. If you have tons of experience around the issue of race through lived experience, it literally becomes your glasses for how you see the incoming information. But if all you've had are tons of experiences around education, you will tend to use education to see everything else, just like the person who sees and has experiences around race tends to be more familiar. Why? We build language around our experience. So what we're listening to gets filtered first through our experiences. And what we have to train ourselves to do is listen for what we're not hearing. But we're not trained to, to listen that deeply. We're ten, we listen as a charitable compliment to the other. We listen um, because it's nice. We listen because we want, don't want to be mean. We listen because we want people to think we're, we're really, but what are we doing when we're listening? 
we're processing an answer. That answer usually comes out of your experiences. And those experiences start to shape how you think about these other experiences. So the answers that are given back, oftentimes that come out of our mouths after we have listened, fill us up more than they do the people we're speaking to. That's the problem with listening, right? Now there are, there's another six hours I could give to you on that, but I'm gonna... I feel like that's so good. And yet, so like, oh, ouch. <laughs> Wow. Mm -hmm. right, so listening is not as easy as we think it is. In fact, it's, it's very difficult to listen. This is why we have to hurry the listening. Yes, Pastor Antonio. Hey, thank you, bro. It's, mm -hmm. it's um, when I heard you speak, um, I thought about the Robert, um, um, the Quaker who wrote the celebration of disciplines and uh, his name is Richard Foster. Yeah. Richard Foster. Mm -hmm. And I said, you should add to his list because if I'm correct, I don't think he has that discipline. Mm -hmm. And when I hear you and the work that God has given you, it is so profound because what you are speaking about is something that we struggle in all the isms, sexism, classism, racism. But what I wanted to commend you on and what gets lost in conversation is how you use Jesus as the model for listening. I believe that, and I'm, this is my question to you, and is the reason why we don't want to listen because we don't want to hear what might be said. Mm, mm. And if we're going to, it's, it's one of the frustration I have with church leaders who I think we should be the voice out front on some of the culture issues we have is I don't think we are listening to the people who are crying and hurting and we are the ones that should be the ones that are listening. And I, 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 I'm curious mm -hmm. from you, do you feel that that is the biggest struggle that you've seen among even the different cultures is that we don't wanna listen. Today, I, I, I listened to the dialogue in, in, on C-SPAN today. Here were the Asian Americans trying to get these congressmen to listen to them, but they wasn't hearing them. They turned their conversation to, into something else. They said, hey, we're being treated, mistreated because of the coronavirus. We're being targeted. It was amazing how they were just talked over. So do you sense that that is the, one of the biggest struggles is that we don't want to hear the truth? You know, this is, um, I'll give you an ex um, just an experience that, that really helped me kind of understand a little bit about what you're saying. Um, this was my first um, work um, trip to and project in Colombia, Berenquil, Colombia, and they have had a 50 year civil war. And um, the local presbytery brought um, folks together to do a forum on um, the peace process. And they asked me to sit on the panel at the last minute. And I was like, well, okay, I'll just, I'll just, whatever you want me to do. I, I don't speak Spanish fluently, but whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm your, your guest. The man who went before me stood up and said, my brother was killed by the government. And in 15 years since his killing, I have never spoken about his murder and he began to cry. I'm supposed to follow that. And what you heard a little bit today is what, is what I shared with him six, seven years ago, right? What I shared with the group was, how can we have such a ministry of listening that someone can go 15 years and never 
never speak about such trauma. In many ways, now what we know is he is actually still 15 years at that space because he's never been able to develop language to help him go through the process of healing. And now you're throwing a peace process at him? We need to do a lot of listening first. I think there's a lot there. What I have experienced is that we're afraid of what people are saying in many ways because it can indict us. It can make us feel guilty. It can make us feel ashamed. And we then take what they've said. And while they're saying it, we're building a rebuttal. And if, if we really value the word of God, right? The spoken word, the written word, that God is that, that logos, right? The logos of God. Then what we've got to be present to is that their words can make us feel a certain way, but we've got to do a lot of work to make sure that the words that we are um, recipients of in our own selves, that we process in our own selves are actually from God. Shame, debilitating shame is not from God. And paralyzes us from actually listening. So instead of receiving those words as words of shame, we then have to do the work to say, hold on one second. I need to, to get my ear clear because it's blocked by shame. And I'm not really hearing you right now. And until I can hear you without shame, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm present, but I'm not hearing you. Right? If we don't believe that God, Jesus heard things that frustrated and irritated and angered him, <laughs> then we need to read the text again, right? Because <laughs> it's present there. It is. It's, it's there. Great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got a sister that got a question. She's got her hand up. Yeah, go for it. I don't, I can't see that. Go ahead. Oh, is it Arlene? Pastor yes, Arlene? Hi, how are you? I'm going to see how I can put my hand down. Okay, there you go. Hi. Um, Thank you, Pastor Daryl. Um, you know, you were saying about that lady, she cried. But that's another way of communicating because some people don't know how to communicate, right? So mm -hmm. emotion is another way of communicating how you feel. And uh, I was just thinking that... Mm -hmm. In reference to listening, um, some people just don't know how to speak. So they act out, right? That's what, what's happening, right? So with regards to a lot of social media going on, everything filling in your ear gate, right? Social media, news, whatever. And then they come to a conclusion of what they believe as truth. And I think that that's, you know, my question is, how do you um, build a, a relationship to speaking with people if they have these truths or their perspective on how they see things that are not really true, you know? So people build up barriers based on their beliefs, right? You know, mm -hmm. I just want to know if you can speak to that. I know that was a lot of questions yeah. at one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the best way I can answer that is that the ear... Um, will either be a gift or it can be a curse. Um, people will, will look for what they want to hear, right? As the Bible says that, that essentially that is a marker of the kind of day we live in is where people look for just what they want to hear. And they become, we, be, we become, um, particular kinds of listeners. The, the, so this is going to wreck some folks. So I'm going to admit that this is challenging. Go through the scripture of Jesus's life and look at how Jesus welcomes the conversation with those who are not from his tribe. 
and then he debate with those from his tribe. We do the opposite. We welcome the words from our tribe and we debate those not from our tribe. You know how much of the biblical text we would have to get rid of if we simply erased conversations that Jesus was having with those like him from his tribe, where he was agreeing with them. If you erased the text where he was disagreeing with his own, you can erase a lot of Bible. We do the opposite. We pick the media, we pick the pastors, we pick the preachers who are from our tribe and we agree with them, which means we're not cautious listeners. And then we find the people we disagree with and develop responses before they're done speaking, which means there's not much of a biblical text we could write from that interaction, right? Instead, there's these long conversations that Jesus has with people that are not from his tribe. What if we were to practice that? Our goal is to have these long listening sessions and times with people who are not from our tribe. What would we, what would we lose in that? What would we gain in that? Or to think differently, what kind of healing would they experience if they saw that you served the kind of God, that we served a kind of God that could give us the kind of peace in ourselves to be with those who are not like us and still listen? or be with those who don't like us and still listen. And maybe this is why we're led to, the, to come back to loving our enemies. And maybe that's the way we love our enemies is actually just to listen to them, right? To, to take their conversation and their points of interest into ourselves as listening. Um, Miroslav Volf, the theologian said, and many times we feel like in that moment that what they're saying is somehow going to um, infect us with evil and sin. But we have to see our God is bigger than that. We have to see that the Holy Spirit is greater than that. Mm -hmm. So as not to be um, afraid to take in those words. And in many ways, taking in those words works differently than what we might imagine instead of it convincing us of something we shouldn't believe actually it's doing what it did to the samaritan woman come see a man like she became that evangelist come see this guy what did nicodemus do he became convinced so much so the next time we hear about him he's the one buying the coffin for jesus right oh. These, these are the ways in which we can enter into this space, but it's not the way we're enculturated. Great question, Arlene. But you ask a, a big question, by the way. I just, I just tried I know, to get a little but, piece of it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a big question because when you're dealing with the young people, right, they have YouTube or Instagram and Snapchat, and those are all the things going through their ear gate. And mm -hmm. so they see Christians as, you know, taboo. They already have a preconceived idea. So, you know. Yeah, I, I, this is someone who obviously both in theologically, but also my education and training in education around cognition. I don't think it is an accident that we have spent the last 20 plus years growing the amount of social media that comes into our ear gate and the conflict of our society and the church. I don't think that's an accident. I think it's a process of our ears are so full of everything. Because if your ears weren't as powerful, I don't think that there would be as much information going into our ears, presented to us, given to us there when we wake up in the morning. Our ear gate is hugely important. So much so that I think the gods of this world have to fill it, right? Kill it. And we have to become, and in many ways, what that does is it tells us, oh, it, it doesn't matter, just anything can come in. It desensitizes us to that. And now we, you know, to talk about a ministry of listening, 
is like, whoa, what is that? Mm -hmm. Dr. Callie, thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it back off to Courtney. Believe it or not, our time has come to an end that quick and I'll turn it back over to Courtney. Thank everybody for their questions. I think uh, Danielle also said the next time we'll hear from you is with the mission leaders on April the 1st, um, if you wanna hear uh, our speaker again, but I'll hand it back off to Courtney as we uh, close out. Uh, man, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for this waterfall. Most people say like you're drinking a fire hydrant, but you came in and dumped the waterfall on us. Um, and But it's a good thing. Uh, none of us are drowning. We're just learning to <laughs> uh, swim in, in deeper, deeper oceans. Um, we're so grateful to have you and sharing everything that you uh, shared with us. And I want to highlight a couple of things uh, for everyone on here to, to know. Um, as a matter of fact, Tally will be uh, with us again on April 1st. So if, um, as you registered for the, the, the um, conference itself, the collab itself, uh, you will see him uh, multiple times. So uh, if you would love to hear him continue to pour out and, and share, uh, please make sure you're, you're registered for those times and are tracking those times. So he'll be back with us on um, April 1st. Um, and not only that, will he be back with us on April 1st? Um, he will be also with us again. I got a couple other dates here. So I'm about to share my screen with everybody so everyone can see uh, real quick um, the other dates that he'll be with us as as well. Give me just a second here. Let's hit the screen share. All right, can everybody see that? Um, he'll also be with us here on... Uh, there we go. On 6 May as well, uh, he will be with us, um, back with us again on that date as well. So please mark these dates in your calendar, uh, 6 May, um, 1 April. Mark those dates in your calendars to uh, jump back on here with us. And our next time also uh, coming up again uh, will be uh, April 15th. Uh, DJ Jordan will be joining us. Uh, he has done a lot of phenomenal work uh, in the government sector. Um, he has been on both sides of CNN and Fox being able to give us a holistic perspective. Um, and he's going to have, have the conversation with us on what is the church's role in creating unity. And it's such an awesome uh, speaker, such an awesome leader that's going to be sharing with us on that date as well. And it's cool because he's been all over the political spectrum. Um, he has the behind the scenes and everything. So it's going to be very enlightening. Uh, so we're going to get more than what we're just uh, shown or we talked about in media and just uh, given to us. Uh, he has the inside uh, as far as um, a lot of truths. And but then where does where is God operating in all of this? Where is God flowing in all of this? Uh, so you want to make sure you mark that date on your calendar as well. Uh, ultimately, uh, we love to uh, get connected with you in multiple ways. Um, as you've heard about and you're here uh, in this peace collab, um, if, if you would like to uh, get connected uh, to uh, a peace coach, a senior pastor coach here in North America, uh, to if you want more information about literally a peace mission model, uh, the acronym for peace stands for planning the churches that promote reconciliation, uh, we equip servant leaders, assisting the poor, uh, caring for the sick, and educating the next generation. You can find all of those biblically in Scripture, uh, living out those, living out those, uh, those truths and those things that we see in Scripture. Um, if you would like more information about a peace, um, the peace mission model, or also being linked up with a senior pastor coach here in North America to walk along with you. Uh, so we don't want this to be the end. We don't want this to be the final. Uh, we have uh, some phenomenal coaches um, that are online ready to, to walk with you uh, through the process of becoming everything that God has called you to be as a pastor, as a leader, and a mission leader, but also uh, what God is doing in your church and in your ministry. And many of us in ways, we are making adjustments in our ministries and our churches. Uh, some of us are making U-turns. Um, 
And sometimes it takes a long time to make a U-turn in the ship, but you can make it happen. Uh, some of us is quick where we can make a U-turn in the car. But uh, if you want more information on that, would you do us a favor in the chat box here? Uh, put your name, put your email, uh, put your phone number into uh, the chat box here. So that way we can get um, in contact with you and respond back to you. My email is down here at the bottom on Pastor Courtney at iCloud. Um, dot com. You can also um, email me um, that way as well. But if you would do us that favor, drop your name, email, and phone number into the chat box here so we can uh, begin the conversation of, of how do you get connected? How do you live out those purposes? Um, Matthew, in Matthew chapter five, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, so that is a heart to be, um, to help churches become um, peace uh, peace churches, that they implement those things in their community, uh, within their cells personally. And so, um, again, I'll say it one more time, um, if you want to get connected to a senior pastor coach or also want more information dealing with the peace model, uh, please uh, drop your name, email, and phone into the chat. Um, and could everybody do me a favor as well, before we get out of here, can we just please uh, give some love to uh, Tally? Uh, I mean, man, sir, thank you so much. We're indebted to everything that you shared uh, with us today. Um, man, I am I am just full. I don't know about all of you. I'm pretty sure you are as well. And your wheels are turning. And I got everything happening. Uh, excitement, conviction, um, emotions, all things just running through me. And just like, yo, let's get back in the scriptures. <laughs> uh, and so, sir, thank you so much um, uh, for allowing God to use you today to share with all of us. Um, and as always, we want to be good stewards of time. So I will, um, this concludes today's collab, but I'll leave it open for a few minutes for you to drop your information to the chat box uh, for us to be able to get connected with you. Um, and please, um, it is our prayer that may God continuously make himself known to you. Um, may you continuously make his uh, face smile upon every single one of you. And uh, just know, um, regardless of location of where we're at, uh, if you ever want to know if anybody's praying for you, we are. Um, sometimes you just need to hear that. We I know there's things that we know, but I just want to make sure that you know that we are praying for you as you are um, leading in a challenging time. Um, but this last thought, God could have chose anyone else to be born during this time, a Peter, a Paul, all of those greats that we read about. But you know what's legit about this time, even though it's as challenging as all get out, you and I are born at this time, which means God knows something about us and he sees something in us and that he wants to use us in this period of pandemic, something that have happened for about the time frame. We were born during this time. All right. And so we are we are who he's called. And man, that is a beautiful thought. And so I know sometimes I'm like, man, why don't you have Peter born during this time somebody great, but he sees the greatness in all of you. And so we are supposed to be here at this time to answer the call. So, um, so again, I'll leave the room open just for a few more minutes. Again, thank you so much for being here. And um, again, you can put your information in the chat box and we're looking forward to seeing you for the other collabs. God bless every single one of you. Good seeing you, Courtney. Good seeing you, Danny.